you definitely have a mayor who is uh, whose heart beats for this place and for every person in the city, uh, hearing his plans and his um, his dreams and his thoughts about uh, Toowoomba and the region here. And Andrew, thank you very much for the, the opportunity to come up as well. Really, uh, really looking forward to the rest of this, this morning, and uh, hopefully can meet a few people afterwards as well and uh, and chat uh, and uh, talk life a little bit as well, which I, I love to do. Love to hear people's stories. Uh, I wanted to this morning uh, spend some time talking about a few things. I want to talk about developing people first of all, uh, and then I want to share a few stories about great teams uh, and the culture and the, the people and the things that, that go into making great teams and successful organisations and uh, share a couple of stories of, uh, of Lion's era, I suppose, which uh, will live, me, live with me forever and uh, will be something that I continually talk to people about and try and share a message that hopefully other people can take away and, and implement in their own, own world, in their own family, in their own organisation. And also want to finish by probably going back to a little bit of developing people and, and looking... Uh, at the future personally and where I see a real opportunity to use my own personal story to influence the lives of other people and to develop a uh, sense, uh, I suppose, to put a little bit out there, to develop a sense of identity uh, within every person uh, that I meet that is similar to what my story is about because uh, as I'll finish up, I'll talk about identity and I'll talk about how we can get so caught up in our performance and that being our identity. In other words, what we do and how well we do it, that we can actually not quite understand what our full and true identity is. But I'll leave that for a, a bit longer, a bit later, to talk about that. I'll, I'll jump straight into it today and, uh, and hopefully you've got some, some things to take away with you by the end of uh, what I share today. Let's talk about developing people. At the Gold Coast Suns, where I've just returned to, I've spent a little bit of time in Adelaide trying to develop my coaching uh, to bring back to, to the Gold Coast. I call the Gold Coast home, love living there, uh, and the Gold Coast Suns are our AFL team. Obviously, uh, I was part of the Brisbane Lions, so uh, a lot of people might already sit there and go, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. You spent all your life pretty well, uh, working life uh, with the Lions. How come you're not there? Well, my wife Linda and I probably... Uh, uh, yes, it's a little bit selfish, but we choose to live on the Gold Coast. We pretty well lived there all, all, my, all my time in Queensland, uh, bar one year. So we call that home, our family set up there, and so the opportunity to be involved in a sport that you love and to give back and to give on to people the things that have been given to you is really significant. At the Gold Coast Suns, one of our key values is family. And so we start right there in terms of developing people. We, we talk about what that, what that looks like. What does family look like in terms of living that value in terms of bringing it to life in, in your culture. So it's an enormous part, as I said, it's one of our three key values. Within, that's within the playing group uh, and the football, football department at the footy club. There are other values for the footy club that they hold, but certainly family is a key driver for us. This is a real big one for me about what I've learned over time. The reality is that it's really easy to see what people can't do. But I really believe that it's essential to recognise what people can do, what God has gifted them to do, and, and to understand that that's, that's what they're able to bring into a team, into a, into a family, whatever it might be. They're gifted to do certain things. Uh, it has become so apparent to me over the years that, that the reality of what people really need and what men really need, sorry to, uh, to uh, take it just into the men's domain, but that's where I've mainly worked in, young men. What they really need is belief. They lack a lot of belief and some might look like they've got a lot of self-belief but often that's just talking themselves up to make themselves feel like they've got belief. But the greatest thing we can do is encourage. The greatest thing we can do is sow belief into people and so the Gold Coast Suns, we recognise what people can do and that's, that's our driver as coaches to keep each other accountable that we're looking for the great in people. We're looking for the, the, the talent in people and what they do bring. Uh, and, and from there, what we do in terms of development... Uh, because our colours are predominantly gold and red, we uh, use those colours a lot in, in our talk and, and in our language. And, and we talk about bringing your gold to game day. So we talk about what, what you can do, what is your gold, what is, what is the talent that you bring to the team, what is the role that you play for the team, and can you bring your gold to game day? Because we know if we uh, help our team bring their gold together on game day, that we will be a significant team, a significant force in the AFL, just like the Brisbane Lions were 
back in the early 2000s. Oop. One too many, sorry. Let me talk a little bit about this concept, feed forward or the one, two, three method. Picture, uh, top picture there is a, a young fella, it's a, actually a picture of a bit of video that you might be able to view on the Sun's website if you want to go there. The guy's name is Braden Crossley. He's one of six players who's come through our Gold Coast Academy over the last few years that played together in our AFL team down in Ballarat a couple of weeks ago now. This young man is a burly product, burly heads on the Gold Coast. I saw him with my own son when he was about 12 or 13. He's a big giant then compared to the young fellas, but that was when I first met this young guy. He made his debut a couple of weeks ago and the vision on the side is that a meeting where the team was revealed and he didn't know going into that meeting like another one of our debutantes that week, didn't know that he was going to be debuting and the, the amazing thrill of being able to talk and speak and, and introduce him and, and what he's been through. But when I talk about feed forward and the one, two, three method, I, I use Braden as a great example because about probably four weeks into his first pre-season at an AFL level, he's been in our academy program clearly, but four weeks into his first pre-season at an AFL club, he was challenged to lift his willingness to be a professional athlete. Now, it's a bit hard to be putting the pressure on someone first year of an AFL career, but, but they're well paid and we want them to succeed. We want them to bring their gold and to, and to, and to be everything that they, they want to be as an AFL player. So he was challenged because there were some choices and decisions he was making in terms of things he was doing and then there were some other choices he was making in terms of things he wasn't doing that could help him become the best contributor to the Gold Coast Suns Football Club. And, and, and why I say that is because those type of conversations take a particular method, which I like to call feed forward. Feedback has always been a terminology that takes us immediately to what someone did wrong or the problem that we have currently. Whereas feed forward is a fantastic development method to talk to people with. What it does, the one, two, three is about, number one is what are we trying to achieve? If I can start a conversation, even if someone's made a major mistake, if I can start a conversation with what are we trying to achieve, I can paint a picture of where we're trying to get to, one, one to one or as a collective. So number one in feed forward is what are we trying to achieve? Number two is, okay, what's the reality? What is the situation at the moment? And that becomes a dialogue between coach and player as to where are we really at so we can reach agreement in where we're at, what, what challenges do we have? Because what we want to achieve out here and where we're at on the timeline, we're then looking at number three, a gap, and what the solution is to that gap. It's a really significant way of making sure we have a conversation that can be used, and we use it a lot in tough conversations like that where we're, we're challenging standards, but we talk about what we're trying to achieve first. Because if we go to, if we went to Braden with a, with a negative uh, hard stick on mistakes and errors and bad choices he'd made, immediately what um, I understand now is it sends a person into a defensive mode and a mode of, of not being able to receive the message as well. But if we paint a picture of what we're trying to achieve, what they do bring, and then we get an honest assessment of the reality and work together on a solution, we can take a person forward, e.g. That's, e. that's why it's called feed forward as a method. I think it's a really significant thing I've learnt in uh, my own development as a coach. And then talking about uh, a story from the Lions way back, we, we were a team, we finished on the bottom in 98, finished, got knocked out in 99, made the finals in Lee Matthews' first year, and then 2000 finished about fifth, but 2001 was a significant year, clearly. We uh, got to about round 10, and we were four wins and five losses at the time. So the year was about to fall away and drop away if we were about to lose one more game, four and six, all of a sudden we're teetering on missing finals again. We came up against Essendon, who were the invincible team at the time. They lost one game in about two years, uh, and the Bombers were a significant unit. We were playing at the Gabba, fortunately, but the two weeks before, we'd lost by five, we five points the week before and lost by 90-odd points down in Melbourne the week before. So we weren't in huge form, and it was a mighty challenge. Uh, that week, Lee Matthews had watched a movie called Predator. I won't go into the details, because it's, uh, it's a bit of one of those gory movies. But, uh, but 
But the reality was this movie is about a team of people who understand to take down the invincible. Everyone has to know their role, accept their role, and then determine to perform their role as well as they can on game day. It's a really simple message that a lot of footy clubs will talk about, particularly know your role. You'll hear that language a lot around sporting environments and maybe even in, in your own businesses. But the power of that message being understood, received, and then worked on at game day was, was significant. We went on and won the next... 16 games, including beating Essen in that, ga that game and then beating them in the grand final as the 16th game after being four and five, 16 in a row. The other significant part about that was this role appreciation award. In that week, we determined that every player would have a vote on the teammate they thought who would play their role best for the team and that we would sign the game ball, hopefully winning the game, sign the game ball, and that would be a memento given to the player who received the most votes from teammates. So it was a one vote per player. Sometimes a team of 20 odd, it would be you know, five, five versus six type of votes, that sort of thing. So every player, though, was appreciated for the role, understood the role that each player had to play, and then was clearly visible of how well a person had played that role. Didn't mean how many times you had the ball in your hands either. It could have been a fullback who literally stopped the full forward from having an influence. It could have been a small forward who had four kicks but laid ten tackles. Uh, it was a recognition of more of the hard team type of stuff that became our role appreciation award and became a significant driver of people's internal motivation to go and do that same thing again. It's a really powerful story I love to tell because when we appreciate, as I said, when we encourage, when we see the good, the good and the gold in people, that's when we can help them reach high performance and achieve all that God has given them gift to be able to achieve. Let me talk about this idea. The uh, grand final of 2001 came about because we won the preliminary final at the Gabba Hammond Richmond, who have now become the, the second team of people's choice, I think, because of the way they play the game. It's an outstanding way they play the game, but it's very similar when I look at it to the way we played ourselves back at the Lions. But the moment we qualified at the Gabba, I, living on the Gold Coast, jumped in the car and started to head home. Late in the evening, it was a night game. And all of a sudden, this incredible thing came over me. Uh, and it was an anxiety attack, without a doubt. An anxiety attack now... I know that every person in this room would probably at some stage experience anxiety at some level in, in their daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, whatever it is. You'll have some, some fear or some anxiety or something about family or about work or whatever, whatever it might be. Well, for me, I've always battled with the, the fear of failure, as a lot of us do, the fear of other things in terms of, you know, the sporting environment really puts pressure on uh, people and, and more and more these days, to perform and to achieve a certain level. Immediately on the w way home to the Gold Coast that night, I had this attack and this, this most uh, worst-case scenario thinking in terms of what happens if I really play poorly and what happens if we lose. I couldn't stand the thought of those two things and I became anxious uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the car on the way home. I'd had a few other experiences, though, where I realised that the, the power of my faith and the power of Scripture to speak life into a position where anxiety and fear want to take over is extremely powerful. So this is what this story is about. As I was travelling home, I thought, no, that's it. This thought won't continue anymore. I'm going to combat it with faith. I'm going to combat the fear with faith. And so I determined to find a scripture that I would meditate on all week to make sure that I understood that, uh, that I, I had a chance to play in a grand final. I'd worked 12 years, 3,000 hard sessions of all sorts of training to be able to get there and I was going to make sure that faith was what I took onto that football field, not fear, the week after. And this is a scripture that I decided to meditate on all week long. Philippians 4.13, I can do all this by the power of Christ. He gives me strength. It's, it's become such a truth for me, such a truth. You know, as I said, I meditated on that over a hundred times that week I even put it on the back of the toilet door, excuse the uh, visual cues for that, but uh, I would make sure that everywhere I went, that was something that was always driving my belief, my faith, that I was prepared and ready to go into, uh, into battle and to do what I'd done so many other times before that. I got onto the field that day and I can honestly say to you that I've never felt so strong 
Yeah, I, I had visions when I was in my anxious time of being taken off in the medicab, literally, before the bounce, just through high anxiety. That's how, that's how fearful I was, uh, which is not a great place to go to, but I ran onto that field stronger in, with greater belief, greater faith than I ever had before. I came to the point, I said, you know what, that my God is good and he looks after me. And, you, and I knew that I could get onto that field and do everything I could possibly do, but I knew it was, a, it was having faith that God would help me do the things that, uh, and, and achieve the things that probably um, I needed to understand don't just happen because of myself, don't just happen because of, because of uh, uh, Sean Hart and uh, me being me. So that was a powerful story. As it was alluded to, I was able to actually take out the Norm Smith medal that day, which for me was, was just one of those things where I, I actually couldn't believe when someone told me that was going to happen. I was trying to actually consume that thought that I was going to be announced as a Norm Smith medalist. It was something so far from my thought. The exhilaration of winning as a team was incredible, but that opportunity, again, was literally supernatural for me to be able to speak about my own personal belief, my own understanding that... Uh, there's, a, there's a greater purpose for me. Even though success has been something in, in sport I've been able to be part of, there's a greater purpose and a greater calling for me in my life beyond that. And that, that foundation, that, that platform for me was incredible. Going into uh, our 2002 season, quick message on, on what happens when teams win because uh, the Bulldogs in the AFL a couple of years ago struggled to back up the year after. Richmond, though, have really backed up well. And for me, it's, it's a bit about this. Lee Matthews got us back in the uh, week of the new pre-season, first night. And he says, all right, turn the lights out. And he plays the last two minutes of the grand final that we'd just won in 2001, obviously, a few weeks later. And uh, it's a bit romantic. We're sitting there, lights out. Someone should have lit the candles, I reckon. I was feeling that good. But uh, all of a sudden, Lee, being the genius he was as a coach, uh, finishes Alistair Lynch, ball in the air. And he says, turn the, light, turn the lights on, turn it off. And he says, he gets, gets a hold of the whiteboard. It was one of those double-up whiteboards. And he pulls one down. And he's got two words on the board there. And he goes, right, hungry actions. Two words. He says, I want you to give me a checklist of actions that are going to tell me that you're willing to go back to the top of the mountain. What are you willing to do in the heat of Queensland summer to make sure that I can see that you're visibly committed to once again, challenging to be the, uh, to be the premiers. It was a, an amazing little meeting where all of a sudden we developed a powerful checklist of actions that would guide us through uh, pre-season where it was probably easy to get complacent, easy to think, oh, we've, we've been where we needed to go, what's next type of thing. But he was incredible as a leader, as were Michael Voss and our, our team leaders in making sure we continued to drive one another to be the best that we could be. Two thousand and three. Let's jump ahead to there. We've won three premierships, and this message for me is a real part of part of my belief system. I think the truth on the day that I came to understand that my identity is not in sport, it's not in performance, it's not in football. Whatever anyone might think about me, there's parts of what I've done that involve those things. But I I found uh, an identity which. Uh, is so far greater than anything, and that identity is in Jesus Christ, uh, that I understand that that came about because someone spoke truth into me. Someone spoke truth into me, and as the, as the scripture says, that the truth will set us free. The truth does set us free. I want to make sure I make that point before this story. At the end of 2003, we've won three premierships, and yeah, you're feeling pretty good about yourself. Uh, we're out at CUB in Yatla and unveiling the new commemorative can for the Brisbane Lions third premiership. We had one each year, and this it was a, a premiership can. Uh, the problem was it was pretty late in the day. Not, me not being a, a big drinker, that's for sure. I like a glass of red wine now and then, but I, I uh, had not had too much, but a few guys had it, a, a few beers. So I was asked to uh, do the interview for 5AA, Adelaide Radio. And I said, yeah, no worries, that's fine. You're always a bit exhilarated. You're still in your premiership celebration, so that's fine. Anyway, that, that call was interesting because I spoke to a couple of guys, but they asked me a question in that interview which was to be pivotal in the next 12 months ahead uh, for, for all the wrong reasons in a way, but, uh, but you'll get the story as I, as I tell it. So they asked me this question about Brisbane hadn't finished on top of the ladder any of the years that they'd been 
winning premierships so far, three years. They hadn't finished on tops. So they weren't the best team in the home away. How do they keep doing it? Why, you know, why are they able to survive the pressure of finals, whereas Port Adelaide and other clubs have finished on top but haven't been able to get through? And I found myself pondering the answer. I only had about five seconds, mind you. It was on the spot. I found myself pondering and going, you know what? This is what I think. That was my answer. I said, you know what? I believe we play for each other more. It's incredible to think how, in, how powerful sometimes a simple truth that you really believe in can be to influence the change of... Uh, actually, it can make people angry. Truth can make people angry. It can make them think about changing behaviour, but some will say, no, nah, I'm not interested. It can be stubborn, but others might say, no, nah, let's have a think about what's been said here and actually work out what it might mean for our football club. So the story for this is that Port Adelaide Footy Club uh, got that message played back to them, that interview played back to them when they got back to pre-season that, that uh, next year, the end of 2003, start of 2004 pre-season. Uh, their coach wasn't happy, Mark Williams. Their leaders weren't happy. They were quite offended uh, because the suggestion was that they didn't care about each other as much as what we did uh, from my comment. You, clearly, you probably could pick that up if you think about it being an opposing team. But I didn't really understand that. Yeah, the year sort of unfolded, didn't understand what, the, 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 what had happened, the ramifications of that comment. But monthly they would meet from my uh, gathering of information since they would meet and they would talk about this and they'd play it again and they'd get motivated and they'd, they actually came up, I believe, with a, a new set of things that they would do in-game in to make sure that they cared for one another. Didn't think about self but thought about team. And uh, it was only when... I was sitting with my wife in McDonald's uh, on the day after the grand final in 2004. Port Adelaide had smashed the Lions by about seven goals and uh, we were tails between our legs and uh, pretty miserable. But I'm sitting in McDonald's in, um, just up the road from the MCG and I open the Herald Sun, there's a mid-page lift out and there's an article that says, Lions sledge motivates power victory, power premiership. And I sort of thought to myself, Wow, I wonder what, who, which one of my teammates has said something <laughs> stupid in, in grand final week. You know what? It emanated way back to a year before where their motivation to do something about that comment had driven them to become a different team. The truth, as I say, had set them free. It set them free to be a greater team than what they'd been capable of being under the greatest pressure. Uh, and for me, even though I sat in McDonald's and I thought about my next confrontation with Lee Matthews, I... I then got this exhilaration of, wow, it's powerful. Sometimes you can say one thing and it can set a person's life free. You can transform a life with a truth. And most of that truth, or pretty well all of that truth, uh, funny enough, I've continued to find in the Bible, I've continued to find in faith in Christ, in my identity in Christ, that that truth, that truth sets us free from all things, even death. The fear of death sets us free from all things. It's very, very powerful. But that's my story on... Uh, Speaking the truth, it's really important because it does these things. It helps people grow and it sets people free. A bit of my personal stories. A couple of pictures up there of a guy by the name of Kay Shragi. He's a European lion tamer and works with massive mammals, as you can see. Massive, it just works with crazy animals. Uh, still does it a little bit and still speaks in schools. He's in his 70s, this guy. But he was a guy that... Uh, I was actually pursuing uh, the love of my life, my wife at the time, uh, but... I also, second year into my football career, was at a place where I'd identified that football may not, won't be forever, but certainly may not be for long, the way I was going in my second year. So I realised that all of a sudden uh, I had built my whole life on becoming a rich and, and famous footballer, fame and fortune. Well, I went along at Linda's request to come to church with her because the other thing I besides chasing the love of my life at the time, I also had started to really get a deep thought about what is my meaning and purpose? What is, what is my identity beyond football? Who am I? Uh, and I went along to uh, the church on this Sunday morning down the Gold Coast and this guy was speaking. He'd been a Christian for 14 years, giving his testimony, talking about these amazing experiences with animals. And I'm sitting in amongst 300 people and he says this most incredible thing. European lion tamer, of course, so you'll get the lion connection I'm trying to make with that and, uh, and how my life changed and that sort of thing. But the, 
But the reality of what he said was powerful. He, he, he looked out to the audience. He said, you know what? You could be a footballer. Probably talking about soccer players, but that's all right. You could be a footballer with all the fame and fortune you ever wanted. But in the end, would it be worth anything if you sold your soul? Mark 8.36, you can find that scripture in the Bible. Unbelievable. I'm sitting in amongst 300 people and I go, that, that there is exactly what I needed to hear. That there's a, there's a different part of my story I haven't yet understood. That day I came to the reality that I'd put my whole identity and my whole meaning and purpose in football. Uh, fortunately, thanks to Linda and her influence in my life and thanks to other people along the journey, I've understood that uh, my faith in Christ is actually where my identity truly lies. And uh, that's what I want to try and finish up talking about a little bit with this. So who am I is, is the question. Who are you? What's your identity? Question down below. You don't need to answer it. I'll get, take too long to get everyone's answer. But think about it. If you lost your job today, who are you? And how are you? Is, is that where your whole identity lies? That's a long pause, isn't it? I better get going. It's, it's a great contemplation. Because if you lost your job today, and, and I say this with unbelievably all due respect, and I, I love Brock's story earlier, but there are, there are people who are taking their lives because they lose their job and they have nothing to live for because their identity was caught up in that. Their security, their whole life was caught up in that. We can't continue to have that happen. We have to get to people and help them understand an identity that's far beyond what they do and how well they do it. It's so important the way we, we communicate with people, that we see the good in people, so important. And I found out as I listened to Case that day and came to faith in Christ myself that it's not about my performance. Now, it's easy to stand up here. I know some people have gone, yeah, that's easy to say, but you've been a high performer and you've had all the success. Well, yes, I did, but I also realise that I'm one person in a big organisation and it takes a lot of people to do what we did as the Brisbane Lions. But ultimately, uh, the reality of that is now 15, 18 years gone. You know, what, do, I live on, do I live on that? Well, I, I'm known by people because of that, but I don't live on that. But what that creates is an incredible platform and an opportunity to speak to the genuine issues that people face today and to speak into the life of people who, let's be honest, how, how many people just in this room alone are right now in the middle of some level of depression? There's, a, there's an epidemic about identity in our country, I believe, and, and I want to I wanna speak to that. Our identity is not in performance, but I can promise you, if you don't know it already, it's in the love of God. It's in what God has done, who he created you to be, and the purpose he created you for. When you discover that, you'll have your full identity and you'll be truly free. There is no freedom like that freedom. It is so far past winning an AFL premiership. I can only tell you that until you experience it. Hopefully many of you have and many of you will do in the time to come through what is an incredible community of Toowoomba and incredible churches in Toowoomba. There's something that's brewing for me and it's a thing called the ID Sports Network. The ID Sports Network seeks to do a number of things in the identity space. It's, it's ID because it's about identity and it's not about performance-based identity, but it's about people's identity beyond the field of play. Part of what we want to do is introduce 3D coaching methodology into Australia. I want to particularly introduce it in schools, into, into, into junior sport, but uh, it's got an application to all levels of sport because as you read there, I love this. This is an intro part, so I'm going to give you just a little bit of snapshot before I finish up the 3D coaching. This is the original definition of the coach, the picture of the vehicle there. Um, some young guys might sort of go, gee, I didn't know that was called a coach or a carriage or whatever, but, uh, but um, some of us old guys certainly recognise the beauty of that vehicle. But the original definition of coach from the 1500s was a covered carriage that takes a person of importance from where they are to where they want or need to go. That's my new definition of coaching. Because that takes a number of elements 
and makes coaching so different. Coaching's not about the coach. All too often in sport, coaching becomes about the coach because of the pressure, the expectation, boards, all that sort of stuff. But it becomes about the coach. But the coach's reward comes when that person takes the journey from where they are to where they want to or need to go to. That's the reward for the coach. That's the reward for a parent. That's the reward for anyone who's a leader of, a, of an organisation. If you want to engage and internally motivate your people, you've got to understand that they're on a journey somewhere. And the life is a journey, sport's a journey, business is a journey, and it's about this carriage. Because the carriage talks about protection as well. It doesn't talk about judgement, even though there's times you're going to have to say, we've got to be better. It's a, it's a movement. It's, it's moving people, and it's covering, protecting people, and it's helping people get from where they are to where they want to or need to go to. That, for me, is revolutionary in terms of defining what coaching should be. And 3D coaching asks these four questions at the start. It's actually a study, eight hours of study, uh, and I'm also studying myself to become a, a master deliverer, a master trainer of this. This is one element of ID Sports, what we want to do to introduce into us. Because the connection with identity is that this style of coaching speaks life into people and identity into people and doesn't judge and suck life out of people. That's the difference. It has to be about how do we speak life into people, not how do we speak judgment and all sorts of negativity onto people. So these four questions start the study. Why do you coach? Why do you coach the way you coach, which speaks to the influences you've had as a coach? And when I say coach, please, if you're a parent, if you're a business owner, you're a coach. You're coaching people to, on that journey, on that journey in the carriage. You're coaching people. Why do you coach the way you coach? What's influenced you to believe that's the right way? Have you, have you challenged your own coaching about whether there's a better way to do things, to take people on that journey? What's it like to be coached by you? That's a tough one because there's a, there's a self-assessment or a, a peer assessment or a, an employee assessment, which is tough sometimes, but it's, it's really valuable because you again get an insight into actually what you're doing to influence people, what you're doing to help people, really important. And what is success in coaching for you? That's the fourth question. That's the start of the journey. By the end of the journey, a coach comes up with that. A transformational purpose statement. So coaching isn't just about winning, uh, win-loss ratio, uh, performance. It's actually, it, it, it starts with a transformational purpose statement. This is why I coach. And it often speaks clearly to the values a coach has, the journey he wants to take his athletes on, his employees on, her her athletes, her employees on, and clearly speaks about what the future looks like and how, how, they'll, how together the coach and the player will get there. It's very, very powerful. So that's where I am really keen to head. I'm loving coaching, and uh, coaching's a key part of 3D coaching, clearly, and uh, being a coach as well. But I want to finish all of what I've just presented there by, by just clicking straight back to the identity piece and, and want to leave you with the most important thing for me today is don't let performance, what you do, how well you do it, define who you are. And don't let it define who anyone else is. Help them see an identity beyond what they do and how well they do it. That's, that's clearly part of what we do, but it's not who we truly are. 3D coaching is 3D because it talks about the three dimensions of person, people, body, mind and spirit and heart. The body in sport, or the physical, gets coached 75 to 85% of coaching is done in that domain. There's a little bit done in the second domain, which is the emotion, the mindset, the mental space, and more and more. But there is so little done in coaching the heart and the spirit of people in sport. This is the gap. This is the gap of identity that people aren't getting. They're getting the physical identity, they're getting the mental identity, but they're not understanding who they are as a spiritual being what passion they have in their heart. Coaching in the third dimension is what three-dimensional three dimensional coaching's difference is, and that's why I'm so excited about it. Your identity can only, for me, be truly found in Jesus Christ. He's the one. Thank you.